We, we are going to talk about grace today, and I know that everybody here knows what grace is, right? It's what you say sometimes before you eat your meal, right? Although, did you know that the Quakers, the Quakers, a Christian movement of the 17th century, well, they wait to say grace after they eat. Isn't that interesting? And after some meals, that might not be a bad idea when you think about it. Oh, Lord, I need some help in digesting that fifth slice of pizza. Right? Right? I, I'm sure that no one here has ever prayed words like that, asking God for a little bit of help after too much pizza or a, a second helping too much food or too much of doing something that you know that you shouldn't have done in the first place. And when it is truly too much, don't we cry to the Lord for help? I mean, honestly, don't we cry to the Lord for help? And doesn't that cry for help also include a self-imposed limit? We do. Hmm? Oh, Lord, help me get over this indigestion, and I promise I will stop at four slices of pizza the next time, right? A cry for help and a self-imposed limit. And I know you're thinking, I, I thought we were supposed to be talking about grace. And we are. We are. And I know, and you know too, that there is more to grace than a prayer that is offered before or after we eat. But I am not so sure that we know that grace is not a cry for help. Grace is not the song we sing when tragedy erupts. And while we may find comfort in the tune or in those words, it is not why grace is so amazing. Grace is not something that we can place a limit on. And grace is not something that we own. So what then is grace? Well, I'm going to tell you a story, a, a parable, really. So I invite you to listen and listen close. It's October, and while pumpkins need to be carved and leaves begin their changing of the colors and descending upon the earth, baseball also crowns a champion. And I grew up such a long time ago, a time when the Baltimore Orioles were good, and they were contenders for championships. I also grew up during a time when you would come home from school and, and toss your books onto the bed and grab your glove, your bat, and your ball, and you go outside to play. No video games. You went outside to play. And someone would be named the team captain, and the picking of teams would start, and then the game. But you should know that I grew up in the, the city suburbs. And by that, I need you to know that it wasn't really city, but it also wasn't really the suburbs. We didn't have any fields around us whatsoever, just a street, just a street that T-boned into a cul-de-sac, and the street was appropriately named Center Road, right? And around this cul-de-sac, there were these five great big stone houses. They were awesome houses. And my, my friend Chris's house was to the right, and Chris had five brothers and three sisters. Count them up, nine kids in that family, right? And there was always something going on at Chris's house. His mom was always cooking spaghetti or hot dogs, right? And I always found that both delicious and odd at the same time. Odd because Chris's family, they were Irish, Right? But delicious because who in their right mind doesn't like spaghetti and hot dogs? Yum. And when dinner was not good at the Craig house, guess whose house I ate at? Right? Chris's house. The neighbors, you should know this, were not really friendly to Chris's family. Chris's siblings were often in trouble and doing things that I thought were so way cool, way cool, but also a tad dangerous or you might say, destructive. I forgot to mention where I lived. I, I lived in the apartments just up the road. And the people in the large stone houses didn't really associate with the apartment people. And that's what I um, experienced. Well, let me take us back to the game. The teams were picked, but there was a problem. 
In the street, there was a parked car, and it was a nice Cadillac car. And it was parked at the stone house where Rommel lived. Now, Rommel was a large, white German shepherd who was the scariest dog in the entire neighborhood. Rommel, what we thought as kids, ate children for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But sometimes you, you have to face your fears and the game must be played. So the Cadillac became first base. And if you hit the Cadillac, it was an automatic out. You see, back then we were respectful as kids. Right? But it was also a major deterrent that, uh, you know, you didn't want to hit the Cadillac to get that out. But, but something we didn't think about was something that happened. There I was out in shallow center field, and I was the, the second baseman and also the center fielder, my two favorite positions. And Brian was up to bat. And Brian wasn't the fastest kid, uh, but if he ever did hit the ball, it would travel out to the outfield, right? And so uh, there was the pitch, and there was the swing. Now, to make this a little bit more dramatic and to make sure that you really get into this, I'm going to need you to, to help me with the chariots of th uh, fire theme, all right? Some of you uh, may remember that, right? It's pretty easy. We're going to hum it together, right? Dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 dun. Make sure the people online can hear you. Dun, 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 dun. Now I'm gonna keep you going, but I'm gonna tell the story. Dun, 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 dun. Now you gotta do it the good parts. Dun, 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 dun. The pitch. Keep going. Dun, 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 and then the swing. And the hits, and the hit. Now keep that going. Da, 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 da. Right? And Brian breaks out from the batter's box and begins his, his running, or I should say his drop towards first base. And let me tell you, friends, that ball came my way, and it just went right into my glove, just like that. And I scooped it up perfectly to where my right hand was able to grab that ball and I looked, and there was Chris. Somebody right over there, wave your hands, wave your hands. Chris was waving his hands, like, throw it to me, throw it to me. And I had to make the throw of a lifetime. Keep waving your hands, Chris, come on, right? right? And I threw it, boy, did I make a throw of a lifetime. <laughs> da, 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 da. Right? And let me tell you, it was a throw of a lifetime, friends. It went right through the back window of that Cadillac. <laughs> And, and get this, even more, uh, this is pretty incredible. It went right through the window of that Cadillac. I mean, right through. I have never seen anything like it in my entire life. Right, right through, hit the steering wheel, and bounced right into the passenger seat of that caddy. And Chris opened the passenger door, picked up the ball, and he tagged his brother out. It was the most awesome play, and if Sports Center would have been around, it would have surely made a top play, and I would have gotten an SB award. But there's also this that you need to know. Just as the ball went through that back window of the Cadillac, hitting the steering wheel, and then going right into the passenger seat, just as Chris opened the door to that Cadillac, retrieved the ball, and tagged his brother, just as all that was happening... Rommel's family came out of the front door, right? They saw it all. And we, we ran like the wind. <laughs> After tagging his brother, Chris threw the ball so that Rommel wouldn't chase us, but rather would go after the ball. And he bolted. And I ran back into my apartment, jumped into my bed, and all I could think of was the trouble that I was going to be in. And as I was there in my bed and as I was thinking, I also wondered, what if they didn't see me? What if they only saw Chris? Right? And sure enough, guess what? They only saw him. 
they didn't believe his story that it was all me. And his mom made a boatload of spaghetti for Rommel and his family. And Chris was grounded for two weeks, but I was free. I know what you're thinking. Is this grace? Somebody taking your place, someone getting the blame, the grounding, when it was all on you. There's a little bit more to the story. It was my ball, my ball. We played that afternoon with my ball, and now Rommel had my ball. I know that common sense would tell you to just get another ball, right? But that was my one and only ball. It was valuable to me. Apartment kids can't afford more than one ball. And so I worked up the courage and I went to Rommel's house. I knocked on the door and I asked for my ball back. <laughs> Mrs. Zider called for Rommel and he turned the corner with my ball in his mouth. He had chewed the heck out of my ball. She commanded Rommel to give it to me and he placed it at my feet and then he went a short distance away with his tail wagging and he wanted to play catch. Mrs. Zider then said, he wants to play catch with you. Why don't you go out into the yard? I will watch. I played catch with the fiercest dog in the neighborhood, and we became friends, friends. And speaking of friends, I saw Chris, Chris from his bedroom window, just watching, right? And I couldn't take it anymore, and so I confessed. I confessed it all to Mrs. Zider. And the funny thing, she knew. She knew it all. And she told me that from his corner apartment, Mr. DiCarlo had seen it all. Figures, I said. Mr. DiCarlo is always yelling at Chris and me. That's when Mrs. Zider stopped me in my thoughts. She went on to tell me more. Mr. DiCarlo saw it all, but he vouched. He vouched for you boys. He said that you were good boys, just a little mischievous at times. He then gave me a check for the expenses of the window. You might want to thank him. Indeed, I did. Is this grace? When I thanked Mr. DiCarlo, he asked me, where's Chris? I think he knew, but just in case I didn't want to lie, I told him that Chris was grounded. And then he asked me, that's not right, is it? And I agreed with him, but I told him that Chris's mom would never, never believe me. Are you hungry? I hear Chris's mom makes the mighty tasty spaghetti for an Irish woman. Let's let this Italian man be the judge of that. And let's go bail Chris out. What say you? I say that this is grace. Larger than what we can put into words. Bigger than what we can describe. Larger than what we can comprehend. Greater than what we see. The very essence of our lives as Christians and the needed gospel. Remember what that means? The good news of salvation that the world needs to hear. Scriptures say this. God sets things right by His grace and His grace alone. He makes it possible for us to live in His rightness. What say you? What do you say about grace? What is your story? As we respond to the word right now, I want us to 
to understand that grace is not just something that we, we put a definition to. Right? Grace is not a, a checkbox. You see, one of the problems that we're having as, as the church, the general church, right, and even our church here, one of the problems we're having as the body of Christ is that we're trying to, to put a, a definition to it and not live it. Not live by it. And so we're allowing grace to become amazing at points when tragedy takes place and nobody knows what else to say. We're allowing grace just to be a tune that we sing when it should be a life that we lead. And in our, in our Methodist understanding of grace, we understand this. And I, I want you to just think about this, that, that grace has three parts to it. One of them is the part where it's called prevenient grace. That's a big word and everything. But here's what it really means, that God is wooing you. That God is watching over you. That God is doing everything possible to speak to you, to get your attention and to let you know that there's something greater in this world. And it might be that you threw a ball through a window. Or it might be something else. What is your story? How is God? How can you see God getting your attention through what you are doing or what you have done? God doesn't abandon you. God is after you by his grace. And then there's that moment when we do need a rescue, right? Someone to, to take our place. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Let me ask you this. Can you think of a sin that you committed this week? Yesterday? Maybe even today? And the good news of salvation is this, that God loved you and I, this world, so much that he sent Jesus Christ to us to take away our sins by the grace of Christ. We are saved. And then I think all of us know here right now that life continues to be a journey, does it not? Each and every day, there's something that's new and exciting, but also sometimes there's things that happen in which bring us down, where we feel defeated, maybe even depressed, lonely, feel like God has abandoned us. And so the human life sometimes feels like we take a, a couple of steps forward and then we also take a couple of steps back. Has that been true for anybody's life in here? Huh? And here's what you need to know. That God hasn't abandoned you. God's grace has been with you each and every step, whether it's going forward or backward. Forward or backward. And what does the, the song teach us? And grace will lead us home. That's the journey we're on, my friends, the journey of grace. Sometimes going forward, sometimes going backwards, but grace will lead us home. I want to invite you as the, the praise team comes back up here to, to lead us into one final rendering of the music. To just close your eyes right now, and I want you to think of God's grace. Grace that's rescuing you. A grace that's like a, a rommel dropping a ball at your feet and saying, let's play catch. Grace like a Mr. DiCarlo. Not only paying for you, but saying, let's go rescue somebody. If we as the church lived more by grace, this world would be so much different. 
Ask God right now that you would receive his grace and that you would be a difference maker in a world that needs the gospel, the good news of salvation. Salvation that comes to us by grace and by grace alone. Amen. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain.